Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is on achalasia. In this lecture, we will learn about the definition of achalasia, its pathogenesis, types. We will also discuss briefly about its lab diagnosis and treatment. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, what do we mean by achalasia? Always remember, achalasia is an esophageal motility disorder. What do we mean by this term, esophageal motility disorder? Always remember, these are disorders that can affect the normal coordination of swallowing and peristalsis and achalasia is one of the examples of such esophageal motility disorder. How can we define achalasia? It is a neuromuscular dysfunction due to which the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax during swallowing. It is characterized by triad of incomplete relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter increased lower esophageal sphincter tone and air peristalsis of the esophagus. So now let's explain this definition. First of all, we had said that it is a neuromuscular dysfunction. Now why did we mention this term neuromuscular dysfunction? Because always remember nearly complete loss of ganglion cells of the myenteric nerve plexus is seen in lower one-third of esophagus in almost all the cases of achalasia. So in almost all the cases of achalasia we will see that in the myenteric nerve plexus there is complete loss of ganglion cells and that's why we are saying that it is a neuromuscular dysfunction. There is problem in neurons here and if we want to be more specific there is complete loss of ganglion cells of the myenteric nerve plexus. Now recall from your anatomy classes myenteric nerve plexus is a nerve plexus that is located between the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle layers. Always remember esophagus has four layers from inward to outwards there the mucosa, submucosa, then there is the muscle layer which is also called muscularis propria and inside that muscle layer we had two types of muscle. They were inner circular layer and outer longitudinal layer and the fourth layer is adventitia. So coming back to today's discussion we can see that in achalasia there is problem in the myenteric nerve plexus. There is complete loss of ganglion cells of myenteric nerve plexus and it is particularly seen in the lower one third of esophagus. So what is happening here? There is incomplete relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter and there is also increased lower esophageal sphincter tone. Now why are these things happening? Always remember the myenteric plexus which is also known as Orbach's plexus. This plexus provides motor innervation to both layers of the muscle of the gut. So it is supplying both the inner circular as well as the outer longitudinal muscle layer and this plexus has both parasympathetic and sympathetic input and the lower esophageal sphincter pressure and relaxation are regulated by both excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. The excitatory neurotransmitters include acetylcholine, substance P and inhibitory neurotransmitters include nitric oxide, vasoactive intestinal peptide which is often referred as VIP. Now in achalasia there is lack of these inhibitory ganglion cells that used to secrete those types of neurotransmitter nitric oxide and what is happening as a result there is an imbalance between the excitatory neurotransmission and inhibitory neurotransmission so there is an imbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission and if we want to be more specific we can say that more excitatory neurotransmission is happening and all these things are resulting in increased 
basal lower esophageal sphincter pressure or increased basal tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and also there is incomplete relaxation in response to swallowing so whenever we are swallowing something the normal response is to propel that food towards the distal esophagus and then the lower esophageal sphincter normally relaxes and that allows the food particles to enter the stomach but here there is incomplete relaxation in response to swallowing and those food particles may accumulate in the distal esophagus and ultimately there may be dilation of the distal esophagus leading to a condition that is also known as mega esophagus so now that we have defined achalasia now let's move on and talk about its pathogenesis the pathogenesis of achalasia is still unknown. At present, it is suggested that achalasia is an inflammatory immune-mediated disease. However, the antigens that are responsible are still unknown. We have already talked about the primary abnormality and that is inflammatory destruction of the ganglion cells of the myenteric nerve plexus and it is predominantly mediated by CD3 positive T lymphocytes. Eventually, there is loss of ganglion cells and widespread fibrosis of the myenteric nerves. Nearly complete loss of myenteric ganglion cells is seen in the lower one third of the esophagus in most of the cases. This loss also extends to the middle one third of the esophagus in about 20% of the cases. So, what are the symptoms of achalasia? There will be progressive dysphagia, difficulty in belching, and there may be chest pain. Regarding age group, patients are usually between 20 to 40 years of age. However, achalasia may also occur in children, and there may be also complaints of regurgitation and aspiration. So now that we have talked about the pathogenesis, now let's move on and talk about the types of achalasia. They include primary achalasia and secondary achalasia. Regarding primary achalasia, it is rare and it results from degeneration of intramural nitric oxide producing neurons and these neurons normally induce lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So whenever there is destruction or degeneration of such neurons, there is loss of lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Degenerative changes in vagus nerve or in the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus may also occur. And always remember in primary achalasia, the cause is unknown. Regarding secondary achalasia, it may arise in Chagas disease. And always remember Trypanosoma cruzi infection causes Chagas disease and that leads to destruction of the myenteric nerve plexus. There is failure of peristalsis and also failure of esophageal sphincter dilation. Now in Chagas disease, duodenal, colonic and ureteric myenteric plexuses can also be affected. Regarding other causes of achalasia like disease, they will include diabetic autonomic neuropathy, certain infiltrative disorders like malignancy, amyloidosis and sarcoidosis. Causes will also include systemic sclerosis, lesions of dorsal motor nuclei, particularly following polio. Lower esophageal sphincter dysfunction may also occur in association with Down syndrome. And one particularly important genetic disease for your exam is Allgrove syndrome. And what are the features of Allgrove syndrome? Always remember AAA and they are achalasia, alacrima and adrenocorticotrophic hormone resistant adrenal insufficiency. And regarding alacrima, it refers to an abnormality in tear production and there is either reduced tear production or total absent tear production. So how can we diagnose a case of achalasia? Diagnosis is reached with esophageal manometry and barium swallow radiographic studies. So what are the findings in manometry? There will be aperistalsis, high resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure, increased intraluminal pressure. However, pharynx and upper esophageal sphincter, they will have normal motor function. In barium swallow, 
patients with achalasia will show a dilated esophagus and there will be smooth tapering and narrowing towards the end of the esophagus and it will have an appearance of bird beak. So it is also referred as bird's beak deformity because it has become narrow at the end just like the beaks of birds. No peristalsis is seen. So what are the findings we can see under the microscope? There will be diffuse and almost complete loss of the ganglion cells in the myenteric nerve plexus. There will be lymphocytic infiltration of the myenteric nerve plexus and it is also referred as ganglionitis. There may be hypertrophy and eosinophilia of inner muscle layer and in the late stage inflammation subsides and there is fibrosis. So what is the treatment? Treatment aims to overcome the obstruction and they will include laparoscopic myotomy, pneumatic balloon dilation, botulinum neurotoxin or Botox injection to inhibit contraction promoting cholinergic neurons. Now regarding esophageal dilation always remember it is a non-surgical therapy and here a balloon is passed into the esophagus to open the lower esophageal sphincter and that widens the opening and therefore food particles can now enter the stomach. Regarding myotomy, it is a minimally invasive surgical procedure and here part of the lower esophageal sphincter is cut and that allows food and liquids to pass to the stomach. And always remember achalasia carries an increased risk for esophageal carcinoma. So this concludes our lecture on achalasia. I hope this lecture was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.